You may have seen some recent headlines like this, that there's a crisis in cosmology. Well, is the Big Bang wrong? Maybe. But here's the thing. There is no better theory. The Big Bang ain't going anywhere unless a better theory comes along. So let's find one. This is the traditional view of the problem. It's a cosmic redshift of light traveling through space. So light can be dynamic or space can be dynamic. I say it's the traditional view because in 1937, Edwin Hubble writes, if the primary change is the wavelength, then redshifts are probably velocity shifts. But the primary change might possibly be a loss in energy, which we would observe as a redshift. On general considerations, we recognize alternative possibilities. But here's the thing. That's tired light. Tired light doesn't support cosmic time dilation. Check out episode 5 for more about time dilation. So the modern view of the problem should include time dilation, and it has light traveling through space and time, which means we could have a dynamic theory of time. Dynamic time? Well, we're cool with expanding space. Why can't we be cool with expanding time? We actually observe time to be running slower in the past. Let's say it is. Clocks run slower, objects fall slower, chemical processes are slower, nuclear decay is slower, and light is slower. If everything was speeding up, how would we actually know? Well, signals from the past would tell us. The slower clock rate should be included in light emitted long ago. We know that light gets redshifted when it's stretched in space, but it also gets redshifted if it were stretched in time. Remember that a redshift is a change in wavelength and or a change in frequency. For a z equals 1, its wavelength appears double and frequency appears half. So let's put a light clock at z equals 1. Well, what's a light clock? Well, imagine a light source and detector in a mirror about a half light second away. Light should take one second to travel in between. And then it can just repeat. Let's say that another pulse is sent into space whenever the second passes. So here we have us at z equals zero in the present, and there's our light clock. Let's say there's a light clock in the past at z equals one. Pulses are sent one second apart on the past clock, but we observe the past clock to be running at half speed, and our clock runs at twice its speed, so our clock counts two seconds between the pulses. Now the observer in the past would still count one second between the pulses, and the observer would still measure the speed of light to be c. According to our clock, there are two seconds between the pulses, so according to our clock, light is traveling at c over 2, or half of c, at z equals 1. Therefore, if an observer's clock is running at 1 over 1 plus z, then to be measured at c on that clock, light has to be moving at c over 1 plus z there. So light will start moving at c over 2 from z equals 1 and will reach us at z equals 0 at c. That means light is traveling from all the speeds in between from z equals 1 to z equals 0. You can add it up like this, but let's look at it in reverse. So this would be light going backwards in time. So instead of from us to you know, go backwards and that has no time dilation we'll call that Minkowski time if we add a little bit of time dilation to each step we get this and we'll call that expanded time so Minkowski time which is regular special relativity we'll give that the Greek letter tau and the expanded time we'll call t so our distance is d equals minus c tau and it's minus because times are negative in the past and we want a positive distance in the last episode, we talked about the light cone in expanding space, and we found that it actually travels at C minus HD. In the special case of an exponentially expanding universe, it still travels at C minus HD. It also travels at V equals C over 1 plus Z. Well, hey, that's what we were just talking about, C over 1 plus Z. And that's the same light cone. So if we set these equal to each other and we solve for d, we get d equals c over h times z over 1 plus z. Here's some more math. It's basically calculating the clock rate based on redshift, distance, or time. So we can 
convert from expanded time to Minkowski time, and we can convert to distances. There's the luminosity distance. So in the standard model of cosmology, H is Hubble's parameter, and H subscript 0 is Hubble's constant. You can check out episode 2 for more details about that, but I'm not talking about the standard model of cosmology here. H is Hubble's constant, and H is actually constant. H is not expansion rate. We can determine H from the supernova data. It's about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. There's no problem there. We can also use the temperature of the CMB and H to calculate the average number of galaxies in the universe. This shouldn't be a problem, but it needs some work, and I'll tell you all about it in an upcoming video. The CMB has anomalies like this cold spot, and while this also needs some work, I think I can show that that makes total sense in this hypothesis. So let's review. There's the interpretation of tired light, and that's not directly observed, nor are associated effects with tired light, nor is time dilation possible. The expansion of space is not directly observed either, and we have problems such as the Hubble tension and the CMB cold spot with this interpretation. Expanding time is something we directly observe. So what problems are with it? Well, how about you let me know? Give me a comment. How about a subscribe? Thanks so much for watching.